So, Chris, thank you so much again today for joining me. Um, this is our unsolicited advice, just conversation. You and I talking about things that we are um, experiencing in the meetings and events industry as we're building our businesses, as we're learning, as we're growing, right? So I just want, you know, like I said, thank you for being the first participant in our July 2019 Grow Together newsletter. Um, I thought that featuring someone like yourself would be ideal um, for doing something quarterly. And so can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your name and the name of your business? Yes. So my name is Chris Taylor. Uh, the name of my business is Chris Evans Events and Catering. Uh, and our motto is a tailor-made experience. Uh, it's pretty much a play on my full name. Uh, I have a family member who calls me Chris Evans. Uh, and so I use that. And then I wanted to, of course, incorporate my last name, which is Taylor. And that's where you get a tailor-made experience. So not only is it tailored uh, for your event, but it's tailor-made. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, that's the play on the name. Uh, we were originally known as Zella B. Boozer, uh, which is a, a compilation of both my grandmother's names put together. So Zella B. was my mother's uh, mother name. And then uh, Boozer was my dad's mother middle name. So we put that together and that's how we got our start in 2012. And that um, brought us currently up until this year, actually, uh, we started the rebrand um, in 2000, the end of 2017. So it took us almost a year and a half to fully rebrand and see wow. kind of where we wanted to go with the business. Uh, and so here we are with Chris Evans Events and Catering. Very cool. Now, where are you based? So we are based in Oakland uh, and we cater for, you know, the greater Bay Area. Uh, so definitely San Francisco, Berkeley, as far as Richmond, uh, Vallejo, and then on the other side, as far as San Jose. Uh, and we have done some valley stuff such as Sacramento, Britwood, stuff like that. So we get around. Sounds good. Okay, so I definitely want to, I want you to share more about your business, but um, for those who haven't had a chance to read the article. But for this conversation, um, I wanted to frame your story through the perspective of supplier diversity, which is the topic of our conversation. Um, we always have great talks. And I recently saw an article on LinkedIn, um, mainly because it's, it was about cooking, that it popped in my head and I thought it would be a great conversation for us to have. But um, I want to get your insight and unsolicited advice on what the author is addressing. Do you mind if we do that? Uh, of course. Oh. Okay. So the name of the article, which I love, is Pancakes, People, and Advertising. Um, and it's by author Shannon Washington. She's a creative director and entrepreneur. She's currently based in Los Angeles. And... Um, She's trying to recruit everybody to move to uh, Los Angeles from New York. But. All right, so the summary of the article is after sharing her challenges, she makes um, to make new innovative healthy pancakes is what she's trying to do um, by, by replacing a few ingredients in, in a basic or an old recipe. She realizes you can't add new ingredients to an old recipe and expect the same results. And in the article, she goes on to say, several different key points. Um, what, how do you relate to this article when you read it? What are some things that you pulled out? Uh, so definitely that's one of the things that stuck out to me the most is uh, pretty much trying to uh, create something new uh, using old elements, um, especially old ingredients. Uh, I kind of took it from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, that if you're trying to make something new, innovative, and fresh, uh, the worst thing to do is to start with old ingredients. Um, you can have bad flour, you can have not so top mm -hmm. of the line ingredients or um, exp expired milk or expired eggs mm -hmm. or whatever. And if you try and use that in a new recipe, it's gonna flop. 
Um, it's not going to work. Something's going to taste sour. Something's going to taste old. Something is just not going to be right with that recipe. And so it really, she really does a good job at introducing how uh, we have all these systems in place, but we have all these new ingredients that are ready to get in the bowl and mix into the bowl. But uh, due to what's already uh, systematically put in place, it's really hard to uh, vet out a new recipe. It's hard to mm -hmm. um, kind of go outside of the norm of, okay, a half a cup of flour, a cup of milk, a dash of this. Right, right. Uh, it's interesting because I think I never, well, as I read through the article, that didn't trigger me at first, but now you give me such a new, like, uh, analogy. Like, you know, is basically saying make sure all your stuff is up to date. Like right. just because you use that milk over and over again, it's been sitting in your refrigerator. Right. It might be expired. It might yeah. be time to go buy some new milk and that's okay. Right. right. And you may have the right ingredients, but right. just because you have the right ingredients doesn't mean that, you know, it's the best to use for the recipe that's right. currently. Right. Um, so I think um, it's a different perspective of what she was talking about in the article, but I think it's a, you know, a great analogy to, you know, think of outside of um, what she was talking about, which I thought was great. And what she's focusing on, so the article, um, from my um, understanding, Shannon Washington, she's in advertising. And right now we want to talk about uh, the meetings and events industry, but, you know, overall she's talking about inclusion and diversity. Like she's a African American woman. She always feels like she is um, the the new ingredient in an old recipe. Yeah. Addressing supplier diversity, how does um, what is the current recipe of the meetings and events industry? I mean, so I feel like it's a two fold question because mm -hmm. I also kind of feel in the same situation that she is it's like it's one recipe but then it's like well i want to introduce this recipe uh -huh. um so right now the you know original recipe um it's kind of uh and we spoke you know in a different conversation about how um difficult in the event space it is to become a preferred caterer or get on these preferred catering lists um, and I think that's one of those recipes that are kind of set in stone. Mm -hmm. If you don't know the ins and outs, um, it's really difficult to become a part of that quote unquote recipe. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, one of those recipes that's set in stone uh, where. Um, is, it, is it where the milk has expired <laughs> or is it? Exactly. to check the ingredient dates the, the milk is expired and people are wanting something different they're wanting mm -hmm. uh, something new and fresh and creative and um pretty much these lists are uh i don't want to say d dated because mm -hmm. I, do, I do believe in paying homage to those who have kind of ran run forefront and kind of paved the way um but there are some some people that are dated and it's also she she talks about in the beginning of the article like she sets the tone her challenge is not that she doesn't like the original recipe not that the original recipe is bad she just knows her new group of friends or her her group of friends wants a healthier version so she's trying to use like flaxseed and avocados and all these ingredients and and slightly replace them um, to make them healthier and she wants a healthier version of the original you know so for me like I'm thinking about supplier diversity it's a healthier way to move forward right. you know it may not be the ingredients that you're used to it may not be that heavy maple syrup and Paula Deen butter you right. know but we don't need that in our arteries anymore it clogs right. Up, right we need healthier options and innovative diversity uh, inclusive practices are healthier, right? right. If, we, if we keep going with the analogy. Right. Um, one of the other key points she brought in there was, um, with good intentions, she says this directly, with good intentions, we seek out the new ingredients we need without giving much thought to the environments we are asking them to work in. 
how how does that like people right now are diversity and inclusion is a huge topic throughout all kinds of you know the business ecosystem and now so much in the meetings and events industry um has someone asked you to operate in their space um wanting you to bring innovation but operate under their rules and has that been an experience you've had yeah so definitely you always come against um that especially moving into new areas um the the bad thing about being the new kid on the block um mm -hmm. you definitely uh, find those groups of people that are like oh you do great work you are awesome this is amazing and then they invite you to play in their game and it's like mm -hmm. oh well you're amazing but i need you to do it this way or can you do it that way and it's or can you make soul food because right, you're a black right, chef <laughs> right right, right. <laughs> or even if you're getting good with someone it's like oh well you know i have a person that's looking for a minority owned uh caterer which is you know fine and great but um outside of that am i only qualified to be referred to clientele mm -hmm. or vendors or suppliers that are just looking for minority owned companies am i not good enough or is my recipe not good enough uh to do something for people that's not necessarily looking for a minority owned caterer but looking for right. a good caterer like right. why is my yes. recipe just uh, a minority owned company that produces good work why can't i fall under the recipe of he's a great caterer that does right. great work to not to not be underestimated just because right. um you you are a certain color or a certain gender or anything like that or underestimated and only qualified right yeah for this that and the other so yeah now, another thing that she mentioned um that I, I really like she said she goes into talking about new recipes being the tough conversations that we need to have the tough choices and raw introspection into redefining not only what we know to be true or but to be right it means evolving how we operate and creating a space to listen and engage all levels of people so that's what we're talking about right like right. this this you you mentioned systematically um like the history of say culinary arts or hospitality can you give some insight into kind of how we've arrived where we are based on that history yeah so um and kind of just staying within the topic of recipes and including uh culinary arts uh once you get a recipe that's perfect you can do it with your eyes closed mm -hmm. you can do it in your sleep it's very hard for people to try to implement uh reinventing the wheel or making a better tire right right um and i think that's kind of where we are is you know people have gotten so embedded into this recipe that it's hard for them to um agree with someone that's saying oh well you know we can take out all-purpose flour and add almond flour it's right right for them to understand that change and i think also a part of them knows that okay well if we reintroduce this flour that means we're gonna have to take out uh sadly salt right or, um Right. Paul's baking soda or whatever. Right. Um, I think they understand that uh, with introducing something new, it's also going to take out something old. Right. Um, right. Which right. Causes the the resistance, which causes the you know the strain on all these various relationships because right. you're really introducing how to get rid of uh, one of their friends. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because you're you're saying like it's again it's like they're this is the way it's always been. That's usually the answer right. that you get, and that always been. If we really are introspective, is to realize that it was that way, because you know, truth be told, as an African American chef, you were seen as you know the the low of the totem pole, right? right. And so that's how it's always been. But now as we emerge with you know new personalities new styles new chefs people from you know the caribbean people from this place and that place and that all these different you know skill sets merging 
Um, it's not the way that it used to be. It's not the way that it always used to be. Now we want to say, I can cook any cuisine, right? You can make anything. And your, your presentation's amazing because we've worked together on uh, several events. And your food tastes even more amazing, right? And so, um, and it's not, like you said, it's not just sweet potato pie. It's not collard greens. Like you did a fig jam, right? Like your inspiration goes beyond the, these assumptions or the way that people think it's supposed to be. Right. Yeah, so like- I think that's also intimidating because before you can even open your mouth, people already have this assumption of who you are and what you represent or what mm -hmm. you can do. And so when you um, get in a space where you have the opportunity to showcase what you do and you don't roll out the mac and cheese and you don't roll out the fried mm -hmm. chicken, but you provide something that's on a different scale, not saying that, you know, what I'm providing on a different scale is better than soul food or it's right. whatever. Um, people are like, oh my God, it's right. like, like this shock factor. Mm. It's, it comes from a place of, uh, at least on my end, it's like, well, what did you expect? Did you, right. you know, why, why am I surprising or shocking you so much? Because right. as you mentioned, I made a, you know, fig butter on a grilled cheese with, two different cheeses and why is that such a shock factor right, right. Um, now so on both sides there is a shock factor because they're they're not used to the new ingredient which is you right, right. You, um you step into a scene where oh, okay we have a, an african-american chef that's great now the other aspect to it uh, how do you see, as you come up, you, you told me in, in a previous conversation that you came up from Laney College. So there's a time frame which you had to learn and bad habits that you may have had right. either have created this shock factor or you have seen um, people who don't necessarily know how to present or get outside of the fried chicken and collard greens. How, right. do, you, how do you reach back knowing what you know now to um, strengthen you know, another chef's capabilities so that they can operate as a preferred vendor. Right, right. So I think the most important thing to realize, especially uh, being a minority-owned company, is that even though the recipe is already set, there is a different recipe for us. Mm -hmm. uh, not the same. It doesn't, it, it may entail similar ingredients, but um, for instance, let's keep it with, you know, pancake theme. Right. Um, if someone asks for a light and fluffy pancake, uh, the recipe for someone may be a light and fluffy pancake with a side of butter. But for us, it's a light pancake, fluffy, crispy edges, <laughs> a side of butter. Can I have maple syrup instead of uh, uh, ancient mama? Uh, okay. pancake syrup, uh, can I have strawberries with cream, I want my whipped cream homemade, uh, like it's a totally different recipe and I think if we, mm. us as minorities kind of go into this industry knowing that our recipe um, is literally different but it's also different if that makes sense you mean like we have to operate at a higher level like we have to show up and show out like that's every time. Feel that pressure mm -hmm. every time i every remember time. watching um selena's the selena the movie um yeah. and her dad made a statement that always stuck with me and he was like we have to be more mexican than the mexicans and more white than the white people and so that pressure is on us as minorities. Like, we can't just be the black chef who enters the room. We've got to be the top-notch chef, you know, Michelin star rated. You better not make one mistake. Everything better be on point. You know, every aspect of the pancake better be the best pancake I've ever had. Or I'm not hiring you again. <laughs> right. Exactly. And it's sad, but it's so true that, you know, that system is out there that you know it isn't as easy as an in for us as it is right. for other people right so it's important that we we show up and show out like very important like i think the thing is um sometimes i experience this feeling of like 
Uh, what, what did Dave Chappelle say? Like, um, when keeping it real goes wrong, right? Like, just because you have to show up and show out, don't take that as a negative. Just do it, right? Like, go ahead and, you know, be your best in your optimal. You know, you never know who's going to be a part of the guest list. You never know who's going to taste your food. And so every time, no matter if it's a small group or a large group, you know, work on your presentation, work on your, on the food that you're serving and um, your, your, how do you show up? Like, what is your, do you have a uniform and stuff like that when you show up to different events? Yeah. So basically um, we fully vet out anyone that, you know, works with our team. Uh, we understand that um, it is harder for us. So we have to be on our P's and Q's. Right. There's a, you know, a uniform that's set in place that we give to uh, anyone that works with Chris Evans events. Uh, this is our staple look, black shoes, black socks, black pants, black belt, like all the way to your undergarments, a right. skirt, t-shirts, because it's the little things that people nitpick at and they mm -hmm. point out and say, oh, did you see they had uh, their t-shirt showing under their button-up shirt? So right. it's stuff like that that people really take into notice for some reason. And I don't even know why, because I feel like in some instances that isn't, you know, an across-the-board uh, right. standard for everyone. So. It really it's, funny, it's funny for me, like, um, you know, with my military background, I love uniformity, right? Right, right. Um, And I think what the new ingredient in uniformity is, you know, maybe tradition is all black, but as a small business, um, become branded, you know, where your recipe, you know, where your, um, your apron with your logo on it, yeah. where exactly. your chef hat with your logo on it, like the uniformity of your team, doesn't have to be traditional. Right. You know, you can wear your uh, kente cloth fabric and, you know, you can definitely add that new ingredient there, but don't come with dirt under your nails and your right. hair all out. You know, like you, you do have to realize that like when you're presenting, when you're doing business, conduct yourself as a business owner, right? Like what, what advice would you give um, someone who, like one of my pet peeves, okay, as a client, if someone uh, like lays out aluminum pans, what is your feeling on the aluminum pan presentation? Uh, so it's <laughs> funny you said that. Uh, uh, I, a friend of mine um, who I'm kind of taking under my wing, she uh, recently asked me about that. So we were at a wedding and uh, I, I, just putting myself in her shoes, I I guess she noticed that everything we brought out was in hotel pans. And uh, for people that's not in the industry, the hotel pans are pretty much uh, the pan that holds the food that goes into the Schaefer. Mm -hmm. um, and so she, you know how you look at someone and you can tell in their mind they're processing uh -huh. and thinking of, you know, what's going on and have a question. So a few minutes later, she turned around and asked me, she was like, so, uh, Chef Chris, a uh, question. I was like, yeah. And so she was like, you know, I hate to ask you this right now, but, you know, I just want to get your feedback. I'm like, sure, what's up? So she was like, so do you think it's unprofessional for, you know, us to use uh, tin pans to go in Schaefer's. Mm. So I looked and I smiled and I cringed and I was like, so uh, depending on the clientele that you want or wish to have, mm -hmm. they look at those tin pans and they won't hire you again. They won't mm -hmm. even suggest you. They Because to them, it's cheap. It doesn't look professional to come out, even if you're replacing items, to come mm -hmm. out with a tin pan. Um, and to put in a shaper or to replace food. So to me, I hate them. Like I will store stuff in them <clears throat> to events, but my clients will never ever see them. Um, and even in the climate that we live in now, uh, so many people are are friendly and we're definitely in a place of getting uh, to a place where we're a hundred percent are friendly, where we're using, or we have practices where uh, we recycle everything or we do earth friendly things by not using those full pans. Mm -hmm. um, but even to be on a venue's list, 
they don't want to see those fans. They want to see that you're going green. They want to make sure that uh, you're doing sustainable stuff that uh, will help the environment. So that's right. something also that we as minorities, it's it's good to get in a practice of doing things while you're small in business. So when you but it's so expensive. How do you respond to that? It's so expensive to buy hotel pans and to buy this and to so buy So I tell them, and it's also a good practice to get into that practice now, is start charging the client mm -hmm. those, those extra fees. Um, there was a time where uh, if an event wanted or a, a client wanted something to be dropped off that I wouldn't charge them for those pans. I wouldn't, you know, do a service fee or additional fee for those pans. Uh, but now that I realize not only is it still a cost for me, if we think about if you do um, 20 events on the small end of things, 20 events in a year, and every event you're buying those pans, mm -hmm. you've already purchased your hotel pans double. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so costing, is that, is that a part of costing? It is, it okay. is. And so think of that cost on the back end that though it may be convenient on uh, the front end, it's not going to assist you in building your business. Right. Uh, because that extra five hundred dollars that you spent on purchasing something just to throw it away you could have used that to invest in your business and so it, as we segue because i really want to really highlight the fact that you are now a preferred vendor at, at a few locations right and so you talked about building your business so we talked about presentation um you know being that that new ingredient in an old recipe and, and so forth and so on what is that like to move from you know your come up story from laney college now to being a preferred vendor can you briefly kind of go through that journey yeah um so just to give a little context on my background um when i went to school i knew for sure i didn't want to be in a restaurant um, cafe, I would, you know, I was interested in, but, you know, it wasn't something that I wanted to do because it also reminded me something uh, similar to a restaurant. Mm -hmm. So when I first started off, I knew automatically, like, all I want to do is events. I want to cater. I want to do parties. Uh, that's what I wanted to do. And the people that I was around, they were like, is that possible? Can you be sustained off of just doing events? Does that happen that much? Mm -hmm. um, so it really, at that point, kind of clouded me as far as, you know, what I was able to do um, or wanted to do until, you know, I came into a mentor uh, that, you know, kind of showed me the other side or the other spectrum outside of what I was able to see in my circle. Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, kind of leads me to another point is sometimes you have to be careful of how uh, your circle is developed because uh, at many times you only can see as mm -hmm. big as your circle is. Um, mm -hmm. if you only have so many people that have, you know, this viewpoint of what things look like. You're kind of confined to that circle. That are still using aluminum pans. Right, right, <laughs> exactly. Nothing's wrong, yeah. <laughs> So it's important to, you know, network and get out there and meet people and uh, challenge yourself challenge yourself right. to see outside of your circle and to get into bigger forms where, you know, people can be like, oh, yeah, that's easy. That's an easy dream. Like, that's obtainable. Um, yeah. We can blossom together. Right. It, yeah. Of the alliance exactly. <laughs> so um for me it was i didn't realize till after i was out of uh the laning college program that you know being a event caterer was something that was possible uh to build something big enough where uh, not only i can sustain my life but i can also assist others uh be paid more than reasonable uh to sustain their lives also um and, and that's difference because, you know, we're, we're talking about because you're a preferred vendor, which means when a client goes into a venue, right. you're, you're one of the first that they think of versus right. you having to necessarily always go out and find every client. Right. Or when clients come to you, you have a venue that you can take them to. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So that's the process. 
Right. So that process, so definitely, you know, moving from the mindset of, well, you know, I need a cafe in order to, you know, sustain my life and to do catering. Um, I was able to move from that and really see that um, you realize that you go through different phases and different processes to actually get to the point of where you want to be. Mm -hmm. um, when I first started, I thought, oh, you know, everything is working out. I got, uh, I have a lot of word of mouth clients where, you know, I do an event and people are ranting and raving and uh, they're referring me. And so I thought that was the cream of the crop. And then I found out that, um, to actually get into the industry the way that you want to, uh, the best way to do it was to get on these preferred caterers uh, lists with the various venues within the Bay Area. Right. And so I, I felt like within the process of me leaving my nine to five job, oh. um, I felt right. like my first year and a half was definitely a year of grace for me as a business owner, simply because all of my clientele was based off of word of mouth, uh, pretty much. Uh, people had came to an event, they had saw my work and, you know, referred me or used me for uh, a different event that they had coming up. Um, and so I feel like as entrepreneurs, we have this really gut intuition of when things are about to change mm -hmm. uh, as far as the business, as far as in the industry. And so I felt like uh, that was about to change for me. Not so, not so much that uh, people were going to stop referring me, but I knew it was time for me to uh, go harder in my endeavors. And so um, the idea came to me like, okay, it's time for you to start reaching out to these different venues. It's start time for you to start uh, um, kind of vetting all these different places that have potential lists uh, that you can be a part of. And mm -hmm. so uh, within that year and a half, that's um, what I pretty much have been doing is really uh, finding opportunities uh, to really take my business uh, to the next level by getting on these preferred catering lists. Now, and, and I'm glad that you you um, were already aware of preferred vendors list, right? And some of the things that, um, let me know if some of these things were your challenges. Um, a lot of caterers don't know about what it means to, to be a preferred vendor. And also on the venue side, they weren't supplier diversity, the, di the diverse, diversifying their preferred vendors list wasn't a priority, right? Sure. And so here you have two sides, one not knowing about and not and the other not really caring, right? And these barriers to access that you have, the the applications are super long, you know, they're only uh giving these these proposals or these RFPs out to their friends or the the who's who in the industry. And and so like in this article, you know, when we're talking about supplier diversity, what are some of the challenges that you faced getting on these lists right so and i think you even mentioned it with you know asking the question is a lot of these people um what people don't understand is that the industry is very small um mm. it's not this though though it's enough uh you know food for everyone to eat of mm. uh the actual industry where people can eat from the table it's very small Right. Um, and so, so does that make it more competitive is that why or? well i wouldn't even say competitive because it's we live in a tech mecca so there's always something going on mm -hmm. we have we have the facebook's we have the uh lyft we have the google we have you know mm -hmm. salesforce we have all these big names silicon valley people um, that are always producing, whether it's just drop off, whether it's, you know, full service event planning, it's all these different things that they have going on. So there's definitely, I feel enough room at the table, um, for everyone to eat from, mm -hmm. but again, it goes back to, um, if I have a friend in the venue, of course, they're going to put their friends on the preferred caterers list. Mm -hmm. and most the time those friends look exactly like them mm -hmm. and it's not um it's not something that they 
feel, oh, it is a problem. Or, right. In, in terminology, in, uh, we call that affinity bias. You, right. you, you know, you're drawn to what looks like you. And right. so that's why that old recipe, if you would, the old right. recipe is my friends, the who's who, um, and those who look like me. And, and to be very straightforward, who are white? You know, European uh, and also large business you know, who operate at a certain level, so. Right. So I, I definitely was blessed in that area, area because, um, I mean, two of my big uh, venues that I've been added to, um, I wouldn't have thought that I would be on those so soon. Uh, for instance, um, I just was put on the U.S. Hornets uh, of Alameda, which is a huge venue. Mm -hmm. um, which can hold shout out to um, Jamil. <laughs> right, shout out to Jamil. She's awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, which can hold, you know, many, many people um in the thousands. Um and then also shout out to the Contemporary Jewish Museum, uh Dane and Jennifer, who also uh was able to see my craft um and look outside of, you know, me being a minority owned business, but really just saw me as a person who provides quality work right. um, and to the standard that they uh, would bring me into their preferred caterers list. Um, what's, what's great is like, you know, that you said the industry is small. Um, for Jamel from the USS Hornet, you know, we're, we're MPI together, Meeting Professionals International. Dane, we met at uh, the Diversity and Hospitality event that we did at Oak Stop. So, yeah, it's it's knowing who's in your network and who right. does what, so that you can ask those those questions. And, right, right. You know, yeah, and I definitely think you know we're kind of in that space of people need to see change within the industry, and it's going to start with people that are already in position to make that change happen. Amazing. And I definitely feel that you know Jamil, Dane, and Jennifer have really you know kind of started that. Um, that gateway into, okay, let's change stuff up. Like this recipe, though it was okay, right. like it's good, but okay, let's change it up. Let's bring right. in somebody, as the article said, let's bring in someone that can do a bomb sugar-free pancake, or let's bring in somebody that can do a pancake bar where you have different fixings. So, And there's nothing worse than getting a client who wants something different and you don't have a caterer that can do it. Right, that, exactly. Like, even why put yourself in that position? Like, I need kosher options, or I need gluten-free. Right. This caterer's looking at you like, that's not my specialty. Or one of the things that I get, I, um, I was doing a speaking engagement, and a, a group of, like, vegans and vegetarians came up to me, and they were just saying, you know, we need to start talking about, like, inclusivity in the food, diversity of the food as well. Everybody thinks that vegetarians like to eat lettuce right. and that's it, you know? And it got me to thinking like, yeah, that those are old recipes that you go to an event and you eat baked chicken and a Caesar salad. Right. You know, people want variety, right? right? right. That's what we're talking about, yeah. And I think that's, you know, also not saying, you know, for the venues that I'm working with, I, I feel like they really came from a genuine place of really wanting to work with me. But I also feel that, you know, some of these venues are feeling the pressure of mm -hmm. your clientele. We live in a world, at least the Bay Area, where at any given event, you can have a person that's a vegetarian, dairy-free, nut allergen, gluten-free, mm -hmm. vegan, right. um, pescatarian, nightshade-free. Like, we have all these different stipulations, and if you have this list of eight to 10 uh, vendors that only provide this one way of food, um, I definitely feel like the, the, the clients are, you know, kind of pushing back on these venues saying, well, you know, there's, we want to use you guys, but there's no one on your list that can provide right. us with the things that we're looking for. And I even like, I even, I mean, there's no doubt. I love soul food. So I want to, I do want to, uh, hit back on that subject about, you know, you're, you're an African-American chef. You don't serve just soul food, but if the client wants soul food, there's a tailored way to do that as well. Right. Like that comes with your presentation. I remember going to, um, 
uh, what is it? What was it? Beverly was her name uh, in Union Street Station in D.C. It was like upscale soul food, right? Like you can take, again, an old recipe and make it tailor-made. You can make it innovative, right? right. So I just, it, it's the challenge of not doing things the way that we've always done it. Right. Like open up your mind, realize that there's more people and also identify like, the barriers that, uh, to access, like what is preventing, you know, new people from being on my preferred vendors list? Maybe my process is outdated. My, maybe my milk is expired, right? Right. Yeah, so. And, you know, just touching back on soul food, like even some of the leading soul food restaurants out there right now, uh, Brown Sugar, uh, solely vegan uh -huh. they, they had the recipe the old recipe and they weren't afraid uh to make new recipes out of right. these old uh, right. recipes and so to stay relevant to stay uh trending to stay on top of your game you definitely have to be willing to change the old recipe uh -huh. and incorporate new items uh that will produce a new recipe um, right. That will include not only your old clients, but right. also bring in those new clients um, into this new recipe. Exactly. What you hit on for me is that even within our space, we're not talking about diversity just being, you know, the the white, hetero, cis, cisgender male uh, space having to be diversified. We're talking about within our own offering and within our own service. We have to think outside of the box. We have to think of new ways to get clients, how to stay, uh, build a sustainable business right. in our marketing and the way that we, we show up. You know, we have to stay not just with the trends, but we've got to stay up on how to grow our business, how to, you know, take it to the next level. So right. diversity uh, of, of thought, diversity of presentation, it, it runs is so deep and that's why I like calling it innovative, right? It's, it's that change. It is that, it is presenting a something new. Okay, so I just wanna go ahead, what I really wanna wrap up with, um, we've heard a little bit about your story, your Oakland base, coming out of Laney College, worked with Youth Uprising, you didn't touch on that, but you can touch on that. Um, and now you're, you're Chris Evans of Vincent Catering. How do, how do people find you? Where do we? request your services yes, i am on i have a website we are social media driven as well uh so our tag for our instagram is chris evans events um our website the same uh www.chrisevansevents.com uh, we are on facebook uh under the same name i think on facebook we're Chris Evans events and catering. Uh, so we are definitely kind of out there. We haven't really touched on uh, Twitter yet. Um, you know, one of those resistant people uh, as far as Twitter, but um, we're definitely out there. Um, so yeah, reach out to us. We are definitely uh, full service. Uh, well, you know, we do everything from drop off to full service. Um, and so, we are excited about the rest of 2019, um, and we've already been hit up for some 2020 events, so we're excited about that also. So, um, and just to piggyback off of what you were saying, you know, uh, uh, diversity is so such a large subject. Um, that you know we're also diverse not only in our food uh but our staffing and all that good stuff so we definitely look at diversity and inclusion or inclusion and diversity uh from the standpoint of how can we uh, be inclusive in all areas of what we do um from food from venues from um people that we partner with uh to our actual staff uh, so it's, as you were saying, it's more than uh, just a minority thing. It's, you know, it's about being inclusive of everyone and what they need in this event space. Really thinking outside of the box. Now, just so that we can touch on um, partnering and how you and I met and your whole relationship to LB Alliance. Like, 
when we're talking about supplier diversity, what what do you think the role is or how do you see the role of LB Alliance playing into uh, supporting you uh, right. and advocating for you in that space? So LB Alliance is really a godsend, um, especially in this climate of, you know, change. People, the industry hasn't experienced a uh, big change as far as uh, being inclusive or diversified. And so it's, refreshing to know that I have someone um, that I work with or have teamed up with or partnered with um, that is, you know, their mission is to expand the thought process of people who are pretty much st stuck in these processes um, mm -hmm. of not really, uh, whether they know it or, you know, they subconsciously know it or they're just they don't know at all and so they need to be aware of um you know this is the system that has been put in place whether you know it or not um and how do we uh, change this process how do we change this uh standard so uh, to be a part of a, a association uh that is driven by um seeing the the what's the word uh, the change you wish to see in the world <laughs> yeah, that, that person um to actually you know pretty much turn around and pull other people uh keyword that are ready um, right. i think in this process you definitely with all the you know backlash that you can get from it you definitely have to move forward with people that are ready and have similar mindsets mm -hmm. uh, because you can do all this work and uh, get people into these uh, rooms and get people into these meetings or at the table and they're not ready for it and so I'm glad that uh, LB Alliance are really vetting people and making sure that people are ready uh, to kind of be put into place um, at these various venues or uh, to be showcased or um, to get them in front of the right people that can lead them uh, to their necks uh, within the business. It's interesting that you mentioned that and, and I'll wrap on this um, with a, a few more details, but it, it's been a learning process, right? Because someone like you at your level, um, you're ready. You, you, you've been doing this, you're ready and you see the need for you know advocacy promotion and support you see the value of it and through this learning process like you said not everyone's ready because they're unaware of its value right and so getting people to understand the value i've received so many like deer in the headlights like what do you mean you know like like shannon touches on in the article like this is the way we've always done it and um or people just assuming that they can't become a preferred vendor or for you know preferred caterer because they don't know how to do this this and this and and my goal becomes how can i connect someone just entering who isn't necessarily quote unquote ready introduce them to someone like yourself who has been doing it and collaborate right because if we teach each other about our different opportunities that are out there and we show these venues and we show the different suppliers and and vendors out there that it's time for a change and that will help people get ready you know yeah. like this has been a learning process and i you know i appreciate you so that's why like you being a feature and you being so open to doing the interview and being featured are also like important and uh, appreciate it for me so right i think within that uh it's it's easy for you know for the person that's not being included or the person that's being rejected um, to point the finger and say, you know, this isn't inclusive or there isn't diversity. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, that's the easy part. Um, and the hard part comes in with acknowledging that it's easy to point the finger, but it's not so easy to point the finger back at yourself and say, uh, mm -hmm. if I want these people to change, I also have to realize that there are some things about me and my practices that need to change as well. Mm -hmm. um, so going into that space of, you know, bringing more people into um, LV Alliance or for me instance, 
uh, me bringing people under my wing is to let them know that it's easy to point the finger and say what people aren't doing, but what are we doing to make that change? So when we do go point the finger, our bases are covered. Like we're yeah. good on our end. So it's important uh, that people acknowledge, you know, yes, there needs to be change in the industry, but let me be the change in myself first. My that mom used to say, cross your T's and dot your I's. Listen, you have to. <laughs> right. Sometimes yeah. you have to double cross them just to make right. sure. <laughs> so many lines on this T because it's attention to yeah. detail, right? Like uh, you're you, also, you know, when when that event is being photographed, that that content lives in the cloud forever, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you're you're it's an opportunity to show your branding. It's an opportunity to show how you present yourself, and yes. you everything know. is an opportunity from. Right doing something with only five to ten people to doing something with a thousand people you never know where your next uh come up may be and right. so it's important that every event you use it as a opportunity to shine uh and make sure you're putting your best foot forward okay and then lastly i just want to say you know in all this unsolicited advice that you're giving chris you know that we want people to listen in, in the blog you wrote, Trailblazer. Close out for me on what it is to you to be a trailblazer. Um, so many times when I think of trailblazer, I feel as though it's someone that's really in the trenches. Um, it's not a clean job. It's not always a fun job. It's not always this picture perfect, oh, we're dancing and skipping in the middle of daisies and stuff like that. Um, so it's really the nitty gritty. It's really um, digging out the, you know, follow ground and really just making a straight path for the people that's coming behind you where they don't have to deal with as much um, of, you know, I hate to say it, the BS <laughs> of the mm -hmm, industry. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's really kind of laying the ground because the honest thing about it is I can trailblaze through however many years and make, you know, all this room for, uh, people to come behind me. But the truth is by the time my reign ends, you know, there's going to be a whole new set of issues. So I'm really just making this part of the process clear. So the next people, the next trailblazers don't have to deal with this as much, but they can deal with the next issues uh, to come. They can say, you know, people already have paid this road. People have already done this to get us to this position uh, in the industry. And now it's up to us to, you know, do the next phase of it. Mm. Nice. Okay. So close out this last, it's like, it's like the, uh, the, the church close out. There's like 15 right, of them. Right, right. Um, yeah. How can we find you? Where do we find you? And which, what do you have coming up next? Uh, so again, you can find me on all social medias. We are looking for talented team members. Uh, we are actually in the process. Um, I'll give a little, you know, little information but uh we are planning to do a rebranding launch party uh so that's something that we have coming up that we're excited to do we are going to be partnering with a event planner who's also uh, launching their business so we're excited about that uh we have a few things coming up the rest of this year um and you know hopefully we'll be able to meet and greet um, whoever has listened to this interview, if you see us at any um, ILEA networking events or uh, MPIs or WIPAs or anything like that, we definitely, if you, you know, see our name on the list, uh, please come find us because we would love to connect. Yeah, and we'll just say let's blossom together, right? You know? Okay. All right, thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate you. Um, this was Unsolicited Advice Conversation with Chris Evans, events and catering based in all of the Bay Area. And we'll fly to Africa if you need them to. Of course we will. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's get it. Um, enjoy, what is it today? Today's Monday. So enjoy the rest of your week. I will, I will. Thank all you. Right. Uh, talk to you soon. Okay. <laughs> all right.